It's my first time in a cryobiology meeting, and actually you will see why. It's because I don't do anything that is alive. The things I'm going to present to you today is a very simple system, but look in excruciating detail. I'm going to talk about pure water and solutions, and particularly how does water form ice, and what controls the temperature at which ice forms on cooling down, and also I will, start, I will show very little about rewarming of these solutions. So the main question I want to address is what determines the freezing temperature of ice. And actually, this temperature is something that is critical for many areas, from the areas here in cryobiology and also in atmospheric sciences. And actually, the main question is, what is the rate of crystallization of water, and how can we predict the temperature at which water is going to freeze unavoidable on cooling? What we know for sure is that to to produce ice, we have to go below the freezing point, the melting point, the equilibrium melting point, because the nucleation of ice requires the formation of, nu of a small nuclei spontaneously from the mixture, and this is something that requires an activation energy. So what we know is that although the stable water, okay, I will use my pointer that is quite feeble, uh, although the stable water limit is at zero centigrade in the case of room pressure, we have to cool down significantly to have homogeneous nucleation, and this homogeneous nucleation is without the assistance of any surface, and by about minus 32 centigrade you can start seeing some homogeneous nucleation, but it's very, very low, and by minus 40 centigrade the crystallization rate is so fast that it cannot be measured in experiments. So there is a very steep uh, function of the temperature on the cooling rate, and this defines the non-equilibrium room homogeneous temperature of nucleation TH. This is the line I'm showing here in red. So what is interesting about this is that there have been a wealth of experimental evidence starting from the work of Austin Engel in 1976 and then more recently, I would say the definitive paper is on 2000 by Coop and co-workers, showing that if you know the thermodynamics of liquid water, the water activity that is the chemical potential, you can predict the temperature freezing of ice. And that's quite unusual because it doesn't happen for other liquids and relates the equilibrium thermodynamics of the liquid with the non-equilibrium freezing point. So the question is what's going on and why we can, how can we explain this fact? We also know something else that is very important, and this also started several years ago with the study of the anomalous properties of water. Water is known to have several anomalous properties, particularly in the thermodynamics, in the dynamics, and the structure. And in terms of the thermodynamics, I would like to emphasize two of them that I'm showing here. The first of all is that different from other liquids, the water density has a maximum at four centigrade that we're all aware of here in this audience. And this is very unique or distinct from water. And what is known is that the density of water would plunge significantly when we go into a super cool region if we can prevent crystallization. On the other hand, something that is even more astonishing, and I think that is the work of Austin Angel in 1973 and also some work in Russia at the same time that showed this, is that the heat capacity of water increases significantly on cooling and actually goes up very fast in the super cool region. This is the lower, sorry. Here. It increases very fast in the supercool region in a way that you can actually fit to a power law. And that means that if you follow this power law, it would it implies that it's going to diverge. The heat capacity would go to infinity. It will not happen, don't worry. It will go to infinity at about minus 40 centigrade, minus 42 centigrade. What is interesting is that this temperature at which the heat capacity is going to go mad and also the compressibility is going to be huge and everything is almost exactly the same as the temperature of homogeneous nucleation of ice. So what we see here is that there are anomalies in liquid water and these anomalies are such that when you try to understand what is the origin of the anomalies, you find that ice is going to crystallize this. We actually know more about supercool liquid water, and when we look at the low temperature range and we avoid crystallization, either by extremely fast cooling, that you have to go at about 10 million Kelvin per second for micron-sized droplets, you can form from liquid, drop, liquid droplets of water into ice, into the glass state. And this glass state, shown here in blue, is what is called low-density amorphous ice. And this is a four-coordinated uh, glass that looks a lot like ice, but is disorder. So it's suspiciously close to ice. What is also known is that this glass can be compressed, and if you compress this glass at low temperatures, you can have a transformation that looks like it's first order to another glass. So there's a transition between two amorphous states. One shown here in blue is the low density glass, and the other that has about 20% higher density is the high density glass. That prompted a lot of discussion, and actually together with the measurements of Austin Angel of the heat capacity increase in the supercool region, prompted the question of whether there may be something like a critical point in the supercool region of water. And this question is coming from the fact that at a critical point, the functions like the heat capacity and the compressibility diverge. So one of the hypotheses proposed, but not just if, not 
not verified because of crystallization for water, is that there are really actually two different liquids of water. One, that is the one we know, this is the water we bath in above. I don't bath here, I usually bath much above. Okay? So, and then we have this region below in the white region that should, is supposed to be the low density liquid water. Now the problem is that every time we want to get to this low density liquid and prove the existence, ice is going to form. So what I'm going to show you today is that maybe there is a relationship between the anomalies, the thermodynamic anomalies that you see in supercool water and the crystallization of ice. So that there is the two mechanisms, the two things are really two sides of the same coin. Now if we want to study crystallization and look at this at the microscopic level, simulations are a good, a good method to use that. But nevertheless, this is also quite significantly difficult because when we, call, when we think about crystallization, we are thinking about the formation of a rare event in which you form a nucleus of ice out of the liquid, and this has a big barrier. And this barrier for nucleation that we see here you have to form the critical nucleus, that is the one that is large enough that will roll over to the other side and grow the crystal. But this barrier actually in decreases on cooling, so the magnitude of the barrier becomes smaller and smaller when you cool down. But also it's true that the way this big ball is going to roll into the crystal state, the growth of ice also increases on cooling the times. That means that as we go down, nucleation is easier, but the growth of ice is more difficult. So the other question that comes from this kind of a sketch is what is the structure of ice that we form at the end? And one of the things I'm going to discuss, but briefly in the presentation, is the structure of ice and discuss whether there is cubic ice. And the answer is no, there is no cubic ice. It's a hybrid of cubic and hexagonal layers. So the studies I'm going to show you today for these very simple systems are all of them doing mo using molecular simulations. And we use molecular simulations with a very simple model of water. And I'm going to show you very briefly that the model of water is so simple that it's just a single particle representing the molecule of water. So there are no hydrogens, there are no electrostatics. And this implies that it's very fast in terms of calculations. But there are some things that we have to consider as adjustments because it moves very fast. So when I'm showing you the results, some things will not be exactly the numbers that you remember from experiments. Nevertheless, I have been told that the audience here uh, all does everything in, in centigrades and I have everything in Kelvin, so you probably not notice that the results are not the ones that you expect. But I'm going to warn you about it in any case. What's important for us is that this very simple model of water that knows how to make hydrogen bonds but doesn't have hydrogens, looks like a paradox, but I like it, uh, is something that reproduces very well the structure of liquid water, the angular and radial distribution functions, the distribution function and the structure of the glass and the ice, and also reproduces the melting point of ice and predicts that hexagonal ice is the most stable crystal, more stable by little than cubic ice. So this is what matters for what comes now. Now, the outline of the talk is the following. I'm going to discuss first what determines the freezing temperature of water, and particularly how far we can go before the water, ha water has to freeze, and what's going on there. What is the size and the structure of the ice nuclei, and how the existence of ice nuclei in the glass also implies crystallization and rewarming from the amorphous state. Then I'm going to discuss the structure of the ice form around the, glass, the, the temperature of homogeneous nucleation and whether it's cubic and how does it look like. And finally, I'm going to discuss the complex system of crystallization and vitrification, the competition in solutions. Actually, these are very simple solutions, but I hope they're going to be of use and also in stimulating the debate. When we consider the anomalies of water, I say that there is a density maximum. So here I'm showing you what happens to the density of liquid water on, cool, on, on cooling from relatively high temperature, 80 centigrade, to the glass. What we see is that as the density evolves on cooling, there is a temperature of maximum density. And this temperature of maximum density in this particular model is shifted about 25 degrees below the experimental value. So all the values that you see in the model are going to be shifted below. Then there is a very sharp decrease in density. And this point here that I show in green, and I call TL, is the temperature of the liquid transformation, in which the liquid goes into a low density state, but on the other side is already a glass. So we have the low density glass that is four coordinated, the liquid at high temperatures that is almost five neighbors is the average, and very fast decrease in density in the middle. This is not a first order transition like the crystallization of ice, it's a just continuous transformation, but I'm going to use this TL to refer to the transformation of the liquid in what follows. So maybe you may wonder what's going on that the density goes up and then down so fast on cooling, and this is what I'm showing in this slide. 
What I'm showing here is the fraction of molecules in the liquid that have only four neighbors, that is the signature of the glass, to have only four neighbors as a function of temperature. And what you are seeing here, if, I'm not sure you are seeing because I am not seeing from where I am, is that is the snapshots of a very large simulation. Actually, this is the largest simulation of pure water ever done. This is more than a quarter million molecules. And from the point of view of experiments, it's very small. It's 20 nanometers, but this is huge for us. And in these snapshots, what you see is that as you are approaching this point in green that represents the point of maximum change of the fraction of four coordinated waters, what you see is that there is more and more blue. That means that there is higher fraction of four coordinated. This is what you are seeing in the axis. But also that the blue domains are highly correlated and they become larger. So it's not a random development of more four coordinated molecules. What you see is the development of large patches that they develop on cooling. And actually, I'm going to show you that this is the birthplace of ice. This also is associated to an increase in the heat capacity, that is what is observed in experiments, and actually you can also fit to the same power law as observing the experiments. Now, the interesting part is what happens when we cool water. We have two ways of cooling water. We can cool fast enough that we vitrify or slower and we get to the crystal state. What I'm showing here in the figure is the enthalpy as a function of temperature for water cooled at two rates. One is the rate that produces the LDA glass in the simulations. And if you look at these numbers and convert into kelvins per, per second, it's pretty high. It's, it's really 10 to the four times faster than the experiments. This is because this model doesn't have hydrogen, so it crystallizes faster than the experimental water. But this is the rate that produces glass. What you see is that there is transformation in the enthalpy. The enthalpy goes down and lands into the glass state. And this very fast decrease of the enthalpy is the heat capacity peak you saw in the previous one. Now, if you go slower, of course it's going to crystallize. But what is remarkable about this figure is not that it crystallizes, it's that it decides to crystallize when it reaches the point that is the same as which the change in temperature, the change in density, the change in structure, and the change in the, in, and the peak in the heat capacity occurs. So this point, Tx, that is the temperature of crystallization, is exactly the same as the point at which the liquid is changing the most the density, the structure, and the heat capacity has a peak. That means that there is a single measure that really controls at the same time the structure and the thermodynamics of the liquid state and the crystallization of water. So I would like to now bring your attention to the other picture, the picture that shows the structure of the ice and the glass form. I'm showing here side to side the results of vitrification and crystallization in these systems. In the case that is crystallized, you see big crystals. We are going to see better crystals later. But I would like to draw your attention to the one that says that is vitrified. The vitrified one I'm showing in blue what is really amorphous water. I'm showing in red what is actually ice, and there are small crystallites of ice in the system. And these crystallites are about 5% of the molecules in the glass, and this is consistent with calorimetric, experiment, calorimetric determinations on LDA. And also there is a lot of this green uh, network. The network is molecules of water that has a structure intermediate between liquid and ice. It's not liquid because it has some order, but it's not ice because not all the neighbors are organized. So it has about two neighbors that look like ice, and the other two look like liquid. Actually, this amount, this green part that I call intermediate ice, accounts for about a quarter of the water molecules in the glass. That means that there is a lot of proto-ice already inside this glass. So what we conclude is that the LDA glass is crisscrossed by threads of ice-like order and ice crystallites. This is what really produces crystallization and rewarming. But now I would like to focus again on the fact that the temperature of crystallization is the same as the temperature of the liquid transformation. The implication that the crystallization is the same as the liquid transformation is that the rate of crystallization has to be maximum at that point. And this is more, more easy to see in the following graph. Different from the previous graph in which what we were doing is cooling down the liquid and see what happens. In this case, we obtain results from isothermal crystallizations. We just wait at one temperature and measure hundreds of simulations to see when it's going to crystallize and derive crystallization times. What I'm showing here is the temperature time transformation diagram for MW water in this particular case. Later, I'm going to show now the one in the derived from experiments. And what you see here is the temperature and the time. And if you wait at each temperature long enough time, you reach the crystallization time. And that means that inside the blue domain, what you have is that ice is going to form. While if you wait for a given temperature, such that you are outside in the yellow or in the orange domain, water will remain in the liquid state, metastable or not. 
That means that if we go fast enough that we can really go through this temperature at a faster rate that we don't stay for, in this case, a ridiculous time of 10 nanoseconds. Remember that these are not the experimental times because this is a very fast model. So that means that we can avoid the crystallization. But still, even in that case that we avoided the crystallization, you saw that the glass already has crystallites and the glass already has this crisscross structure that is intermediate between liquid and ice. Now, it's also possible to derive a similar uh, time transformation temperature diagram using experimental data for the, uh, for the surface tension, free energy, and diffusivity, and classical nucleation theory. This is what I'm showing here. We computed exactly the same, and what you see now in units that, except for being Kelvins, should be familiar to this audience because they are the ones of real water, is that the experimental temperature of homogeneous nucleation is at about 232, I put here, but it's quite variable, depends on how much you are decide to wait. And not below, we have this temperature TS, that is where the heat capacity would diverge if we follow a power law. And what we see is that the crystallization rate has a nose, so there's a maximum crystallization rate, and again, this maximum crystallization rate is very close to the position of the maximum in the heat capacity. So what we see again is a relationship between the crystallization rate and the thermodynamics of supercooled liquid water. Also of significance in this case, and it's probably most significant in the case of atmospheric applications, there is a lot of interest in understanding what happens with liquid water when you are, let's say, at 220, 210, or 200 Kelvin. And what we find is that it's not right to expect that the trends that we obtain by measuring the nucleation rates at high temperatures can be really extrapolated down into the lower temperature regime. What we find is that very fast below TH, the rate goes down and starts to slow down again in the supercool region. There is another new prediction by David Chandler and David Limmer in which very recently using different arguments and using not classical nucleation theory and scaling arguments, they found that the temperature of maximum crystallization rate is actually very close to what we predict 223, they predict 216. So I would not say that this is a very robust result, but it's something to pay attention to. Now the question is why do we have a nose shape. And the reason why we have a nose shape is because there is a competition between the rate of growth and the rate of nucleation of ice. The rate of growth itself is fastest at about, in this model, is fastest at about uh, 240 Kelvin or 230 Kelvin. But the key is that the rate of crystallization is a combination of these two. Nucleation is very difficult when the liquid doesn't look like ice, so when the four coordinated water molecules are very few, the liquid is very far from ice and the nucleation is very difficult. But on the other hand, when we transform the liquid into a four-coordinated uh, structure, the nucleation is very, sim is very fast, but the growth is very slow because we have hydrogen bonds in all the waters and this really slows down the dynamics. You can see here on the other graph, the difference is in terms of how much, what is the size of the largest cluster of ice as a function of time. At very low temperatures on the red side, below the nose, what we find is that imme immediately you start forming ice and it just grows and grows and grows while on the other side you have a lot of fluctuations and attempts to build the critical nucleus. Finally, the critical nucleus builds and the crystallization is extremely fast. This is easier shown in this picture, in which I'm showing two events. One is at high temperature. By high, I mean just a little bit above this temperature of maximum crystallization rate. And what I would like you to notice is that even if the nucleus is a single one, I'm only showing you here a successful nucleus, then it grows into a very complicated structure, and actually I'm going to discuss this later, is with the stacking faults. While what is significantly different is that below the temperature of maximum crystallization rate, in this region that is called no man's land because cannot be accessed in the liquid state in experiments, what we find is that many nuclei form immediately, and these nuclei grow and compete against each other to form an anneal into a crystallized structure. So it's a completely different mechanism of growth and nucleation on the two sides. The other thing that we conclude is that as the, temp, as the time scale for growth of liquid water is comparable to the time scale of crystallization, sorry, the, of the time scale of equilibration, and the growth limits the crystallization of water in this region that is called no man's land before the temperature of maximum crystallization rate, what we conclude is that liquid water cannot be equilibrated in this region. This is something that actually we need experiments to really confirm whether this is the case also for real water. Now, if we look at the nature of the nuclei that are critical, those that are in the top of the barrier are going to allow the crystallization of water, this is how they look like when we are at a temperature that is essentially the same as TH. 
The nuclei are not spherical, they're quite whimsical in their shape, and actually they are mostly coated in these four coordinated liquids. So in, se in some sense, we have to consider that the four coordinated liquid that embeds this crystallite a small crystallites is also part of the critical reaction coordinate for nucleation of ice. As a comparison, I'm showing here the results from the simulations. That is the first time in this case that was predicted the, the crystallite, um, critical crystallite. And the, sim, the ex, some experiments on micelles and equations of state using classical nucleation theory. And what you see is that all the results fall in the same ballpark. So everything agrees that the nuclei have a diameter of about two nanometers when they reach the, the critical size at TH. Now what happens when we go up again from the glass and rewarm it? What I'm showing here is a trajectory in which I showed you before that if we cool down fast, we go into the glass. If we go slow in the cyan case, we go to the crystal. But now we start from the glass. That Remember that the glass already has this network of semi-ice or intermediate ice, but also has some small crystallites here shown in, in red. These are small crystallites, but are larger than the critical nucleus size already. So what we see is that if we warm up, you see a growth, and up to this point, you see absolutely no change. They're moving slightly, but not much change. And then what you see is a transformation in which the ice crystallites start to grow, and what you see is that it grows significantly and then just rolls into a full crystal state. I would say the most significant things about this are the following. First of all is that the maximum crystallization rate is where you find the blue line below. So I don't know exactly which one it is. I know that it's between 225 and 250 Kelvin for this particular model, and it's supposed to be higher for real bulk water. But even before you reach this point of maximum crystallization rate, what you see is that the ice starts to form in the rewarming trajectory. In this particular case, the rate at which I'm warming up the, the glass is the same as the rate I use to form the glass. That shows that you have to go even faster than this rate to really avoid crystallization. And I don't have data showing that because I thought that this was ridiculously fast. But now, after seeing Peter's talk, I think that I should go faster because he can do it. <laughs> so it is possible. It was not ridiculous. So the conclusion from this part is the following. The main conclusion is that the temperature of um, the temperature of homogeneous nucleation of ice, that is a non-equilibrium property that is related to the kinetics of ice crystallization, can be predicted entirely from the thermodynamics of supercooled liquid water, because the temperature of crystallization coincides with the temperature of maximum transformation of the liquid into a four-coordinated one. The other thing that is important is that the the structural transformation sets a limit of metastability, and according to our calculations, liquid water cannot be equilibrated when you go below this temperature Ts, at least when you are coming from above. Now, a question is, when we form this ice, what is the structure of the ice that we form? Oh, I also wanted to say that this way we can derive a relationship between the structure of the liquid, the thermodynamics, and the crystal nucleation rates. And we have studied this for bulk, droplets, nanopores, all the structures that you can imagine for just pure water. Now I'm going to address what is the structure of the ice that forms. The main question is whether it's cubic ice, because there has been a lot of discussion in the literature whether the ice that forms at high supercooling is just ice, uh, just cubic ice. The idea that there may be cubic ice actually arises from the diffraction pattern of cubic ice and the difference with the hexagonal one, that is the stable form at uh, room pressure. We have here the diffraction pattern of a hexagonal ice, the cubic ice, and what you see is that there are many peaks that appear in the hexagonal ice that are absent in cubic ice. So when you don't find those peaks, you worry and you think that maybe it's cubic ice. Now I'm showing you also here what is the diffraction pattern of this system that we crystallized after nucle and nucleation at very low temperature. So this is the one that forms from many nuclei that compete and eventually form pretty decent crystals. But what you see already is that these crystals that are here, they have cubic layers shown in red and hexagonal layers shown in green. So this is actually a stacking faulted structure with very short stacks of cubic and hexagonal layers. And as the hexagonal layers are very small, actually they don't produce the structure, the diffraction patterns that are characteristic and distinct from cubic and hexagonal ice. Let me remind you that cubic ice, all the four directions are the same. And in hexagonal ice, three directions look exactly the same as cubic ice, just that there is one direction in which instead of having a staggered bonds between the hydrogen bonds of waters, you have eclipsed. So this is the main difference. That means that there is only one axis that is different, and to have the distinct signals of hexagonal ice, you have to have very long range stacking of hexagonal layers. Otherwise, it looks like cubic, because in the other direction, it's exactly like cubic ice. 
What we concluded from our study, which you can also see here for this small system, that the peaks that appear in the ice are only those of cubic ice, you can see it here, is that there is no thermodynamic reason for the formation of this structure that actually arises because at this very deep supercooling, the two structures are much more stable than supercooled liquid water, and there is very, very little difference in the energy between them. Actually, we estimated the difference to be in the order of 50 joules per, Kelvin, uh, per mole. Now, if you look at the larger system, this is the one crystallized above the temperature of maximum nucleation rate, and all this very odd structure arises from a single nucleus of water, and also has a lot of uh, stacking faults. You can see more defined what they find in the experiments. The uh, structure is about one-third hexagonal and two-thirds cubic, and nevertheless, the diffraction pattern that you see here looks pretty much like cubic ice, except for this shoulder that is the one, is the smoking gun when you want to identify that there are stacking faults. So it's quite subtle, the issue. It's quite subtle, but people have been learning how to identify these stacking faults, and actually there have been two, I would say, breakthrough experiments last year in which they finally um, were able to model the stacking fault in the structure of uh, ice from at these very low temperatures, and the conclusions from these two papers that are just a few months after the paper that we published uh, on the structure of ice show that actually, as we predicted, the what is called cubic ice is a mixture of hexagonal and cubic layers in a proportion that is about one to one. And this is something that uh, is very difficult to identify, and still there are disputes on what is the actual structure, but there are small stacks of cubic and hexagonal layers. This is what we call cubic ice. Another thing that is interesting is that cubic ice also forms in confined systems. For example, if you do uh, nano droplets or water in nanopores, the diffraction pattern also evidences what it was thought to be cubic ice, although some people already say that it was stuck in faulted ice. And what we find is that, yes, it forms, if you cool down, this is the phase diagram as a function of radius for nano droplets of different size, the melting point goes down. This is the Kelvin equation that was shown by Peter in the previous talk. But the ice that forms has these stacking faults, but what is different with respect to the bulk ice is that this ice does not convert to hexagonal on warming up. And this is something that the simulations and the experiments agree on. So that means that it is possible that the structure that is stacking faulted is the stable one for nano-confined water in, in nano droplets and in nanopores. So the conclusions here is that, that the so-called cubic ice is a hybrid, and the hybrid seems to be stable for nano-confined water. So let me get now to the last part of this talk, that is to uh, discuss what is the competition between vitrification and crystallization in solutions, and particularly what determines the freezing temperature of water in solutions. So before I had this graph that I still keep even if I didn't throw you anything at high pressure, but it's too beautiful to just let go. And what I'm going to discuss now is what happens when we just take the liquid at room pressure and add solutes. So this is the other dimension in the phase diagram. Actually, there has been a lot of studies, uh, independent studies and compilations on what is the effect of solutes and pressure on the freezing point of water. And maybe the one that is most comprehensive of this is the one of Cobb and co-workers in 2000, uh, published in Nature. And it is a very interesting paper, because they show here already that if you look at all the freezing temperatures as a function of pressure, they look completely dispersed. If you look at the freezing temperature of different solutions as a function of the molarity of the solution, also they look very dispersed. But if instead of using the pressure or the molarity, you convert from the pressure and the molarity into the water activity, that is the ratio of the vapor pressure with respect of the vapor pressure of the pure, is a measure of the chemical potential, then what you can do is align, well, I cannot signal, but the ones on my side, you can see that all the lines come together and you have essentially a single freezing line and actually it's the same as a function of pressure and as a function of concentration. So water activity is determinant for the, for the freezing temperatures. Now the question is, what is the microscopic origin of this relationship? So what I'm going to show you now is a studies of a simulation system that is very simple and really mimics the system that would be water with lithium chloride. So as an example of how well it mimics that, I'm showing you here the experimental phase diagram of lithium chloride in which you can see the melting line, TM. No, but it's mine, so I know it doesn't work. So uh, this is the melting line, then, sorry, this is not the melting line. Yes, it's the melting line, but it's not the graph I care. So this is, this is the melting line, then below you have the freezing line. There are two freezing lines because in this work by Austin, they were looking at heavy water and normal water. And then you have the glass line. This is the, the fa as a function of the concentration of lithium chloride. Thank you. Much better. 
as a concentration of lithium chloride. Now, in the simulations, we also determine the melting line, and actually the melting line is in quantitative agreement with experiments up to about uh, this concentration. Then we also have a crystallization line that would be equivalent to this one. I will show you that also they are fitted to the same equation. And actually, in this particular case, as before, the, melt, the freezing line is displaced down about 25 degrees with respect to the experiments. And then there is another line here, the temperature of liquid transformation, that is the one in which we see the formation of these four coordinated domains. So we have now, the only distinction is that in experiments, you crystallize and that's it. Here we have the crystallization and if we go at different rates, we can also see the temperature of the liquid transformation. And on the other side, we have that for high concentrations, what we find is that it going to, it's going to vitrify and I'm going to show you that it's going to vitrify to a normal homogeneous mixture while on the other side where we have the blue line is going to be trified to a nano-segregated system. So I'm going to show you first the vitrification of the solutions. That means that we're going to cool down the solutions fast enough to form a glass. And this is something that is interesting because I'm going to show you, and it's something that was shown for the first time several years ago, that these homogeneous liquid mixtures of water and salts actually end up transforming into a nano-segregated glass in which we have domains of water rich, actually it's always pure water, domains of low density amorphous ice surrounded by these regions of very high concentration of water with ions. So if we cool down fast enough, we form a glass. And this is how the glass looks like when we have 10% of ions, that means 5% of lithium chloride. What we find is that the glass is nano-segregated. And the reason, the reason is because the, there is a tendency for water to form this four-coordinated liquid when you cool down. This is what happens in pure water. But on the other hand, four-coordinated water cannot solvate the ions. The ions want to have very high density water around because they want to have a high solvation shell. That means that there is two opposing forces, the one of solvation and the one of formation of four-coordinated water. The four-coordinated water, here shown in blue, ends up forming these small domains that they just nucleate through the mixture, and these domains are surrounded by high concentration water with ions. So the red water is just high density water, that means that it's water that has more than four neighbors, and the green dots are the ions in the mixture. Now, this result shows that we have a nano-segregated system, and actually it was the first paper, again, by Austin Angel and collaborator in 1968, that's pretty long ago, and the, in which they found that there were two glass transitions in these mixtures. And the two glass transitions, also later work by Kano, show that really could be ascribed to low density amorphous ice and a mixture that is a very high uh, concentrated solution. What is particular, so what we have done in this case, what we have done is that we were the first to show what are the dimensions of phase segregation in these systems, to show the spatial segregation between the low density and the high density domains. And actually, there's a paper in this week of Journal of Chemical Physics in which they show exactly the same for lithium chloride using, uh, now I don't remember what, Livia Bobe and co-workers. It's some spectroscopy, but I'm not an experimentalist and I don't know. So just to give you more confidence that the results that we get are not complete uh, blabber, uh, here I'm showing some results from um, in which we can quantify how much of the blue domains, that is the amount of low density amorphous ice over the total amount of water as a function of concentration of the solutes. And the results in, in red are the results from these simulations for different concentrations of solutes. And the results in black are results for lithium chloride, sodium chloride, and potassium chloride. It doesn't matter so much what is the salt. Obtained by uh, Suzuki and Mishima, in which they did Raman spectrum, and the, from the Raman spectrum of these solutions, you can decompose into an amount that is LDA, another that is just a normal high concentration mixture of ions and water. And what you see is that it's exactly the same. Now, in terms of what you form, what we find is that in all this region that you can form LDA, you form nano-segregated glasses, and then when at this point about 10%, that is 20% of solutes, you cross the glass transition line, on the other side you form what I would call the boring glass, but it's just a homogeneous glass, and if you push it even further and you do 50% of water and 50% of ions, you get a hydrate, but it's, I would say again, a boring hydrate. So it's nothing particularly exciting, but this is also observing experiments. So the same sequence is observed. Two glass transitions, one glass transition, and crystallization. So now the question is, why do we end up with a nano-segregated glass? Why it doesn't form just what we would expect has the lowest free energy? That is, a big glass, of pure water and a big glass of just water with ions. This would have lower free energy because it has less interfacial area. 
And the reason is that in the time it would take for the system to course into this structure that has two very well-defined domains, the crystallization will set in and really the system cannot be coarsen without crystallization. So what I'm going to show you now is what happens and where is the crystallization happening. As it says here, the ice forms exclusively in the domains of four coordinated liquid water, the same as we show in the case of pure water. So I go back to the same uh, phase diagram and now I'm going to focus on the crystallization line. Now I would like you to see again in perspective that the temperature of the liquid transformation is the temperature at which it undergoes this transformation and produces these blue domains. It's almost the same as the temperature of crystallization. It's actually slightly lower because it takes some time to shovel the ions away and we do this at pretty high speed. Now that means that the temperature of crystallization is the same as the temperature of liquid transformation and this is what it showed you before. So let me show you more graphical representation. If we cool back, if we cool fast, we form a glass, and this is the glass I showed before that is nanosegregated. This is with 10% of ions. And if you go slower, A, B, C, D are these points A, B, C, D. What you see is that four coordinated water emerges within the system, and here I'm showing only the four coordinated water and the ice is showing cyan and here I'm showing the full system, and what you see is that there is more and more four-coordinated water, and the ice always forms within the domains of four-coordinated water. So what we conclude is that the low-density liquid, these four-coordinated domains, are the mother, is the mother of ice, is where the ice nuclei are born and grow. Now, how can we explain the thermodynamic observation that the temperature of uh, freezing depends only on the water activity of the solution. This is something that implies that it's a colligative property. Colligative properties are very well known, and we have probably all of us seen this several times. You can deduce the temperature of melting that also depends only on the water activity by assuming that, there is a, that the chemical potential of water in the ice is the same as the chemical potential of water in the mixture. Ice is pure, the mixture is a solution. You just write the chemical potential and you get this equation, in which the melting point only depends on the water activity. We can do exactly the same to predict the freezing temperature if we assume that the point at which it's going to freeze is the point at which the low-density liquid emerges from the system. So we have an, a formation of this low-density liquid, and this low-density liquid is the mother of ice, so if we assume that TL is the crystallization temperature, we reach this one. We say that chemical potential of water in this LDA phase is the same as the chemical potential in the mixture, and you see that it's pure phase of water, mixture phase, so the structure of the two equations are the same, and the result looks the same, the only difference is that instead of melting point of the pure, we have the freezing point of pure water, and instead of the enthalpy of melting, we have a more elusive enthalpy of the liquid transformation, the difference in enthalpy between the high density and the low density liquid. Yeah, I'm almost done. As we don't have a direct way of obtaining the delta H of the liquid transformation because there is not a first order transition in pure water different from ice. What we did is we fit the experimental data and the simulation data, and this is what we obtain. In experiments, for reference, the enthalpy of melting is 6 kilojoules per mole, and in simulations it's 5.3 kilojoules per mole. Now, the enthalpy associated with this transformation is much smaller, it's about 37% of the enthalpy of melting, and it's 2.2 kilojoules per mole for the experiments, this is obtained from fitting the data from COP. And in the simulations is 2.0, it's almost the same in this case. In the two cases, about 37%. And this enthalpy is actually lower than the difference between ice and liquid at this temperature. So it's not the enthalpy between liquid and ice, it's the temperature that is smaller between low density amorphous ice and the liquid. So it's a smaller gap than the one that would arise from crystallization. So what we conclude is that with this expression we can represent very well the, the freezing line and actually this is the underlying reason why the freezing temperature depends in the, in, on the water activity of the solutions. So with that I get to my concluding slide and I show you three aspects of very simple water and solutions. The first one is what determines the freezing temperature of water and the main conclusion is that there is a structural transformation within the liquid that transforms the liquid into a four coordinated liquid. And this four-coordinated liquid has a very small gap with respect to the crystal, so the nucleation is very fast, the growth becomes the limiting step for the crystallization. 
Now, the other thing is that the ice nuclei are very small and they have a radius of about one nanometer at TH, and this is in agreement the experiments, the simulations, and classical nucleation theory. So I would say that it's a quite robust result, and this implies that it doesn't take much to grow ice from these mixtures. And that's why, as these small crystallites are formed within the glass of water, and the glass of water is not a true glass in the sense that also already has a small crystallites, and about 20% or 25% of a structure that is intermediate between liquid and ice is essentially unavoidable to warm up that without, with, without crystallization, at least at rates comparable to those needed to, uh, freeze, to um, uh, produce in the glass. And the maximum transformation is, is associated to the growth of ice that happens at much higher temperature than the nucleation temperature, of course. Now, with respect to the structure of ice formed around TH, the main conclusion is that this so-called cubic ice is actually not cubic ice. It's a hybrid of cubic and hexagonal layers in similar proportions, but because of the stacks of hexagonal layers are very short, it diffracts as if it were cubic ice with some differences that good crystallographers can pin down. The other thing is about the vitrification and crystallization of aqueous solutions, and I show you first that the this, uh, these systems, if they have less than 20% of ions, produce nanosegregated glasses, and actually these glasses have already this low-density amorphous ice, that is the one that on rewarming will produce crystals, and in the case of cooling down, the formation of these, these four coordinated domains are the ones that prompt the crystallization of water. So we conclude that low-density liquid water is the mother of ice. Something I didn't discuss is that the domains you need to grow the ice, of course, they have to be larger than the critical nucleus, and we have done some experiments in protogels that are these solutions with the ions being fixed, and you need at least two nanometer-sized domains of water to be able to crystallize water in the solution. So if you are able to constrain the water in smaller sizes, the water may not be able to freeze. And the last conclusion is that the freezing temperature is a colligative property that really reflects the formation of these low-density domains, and in this way we can explain the well-known dependence of the temperature freezing with the water activity. With that, I would like to thank my co-workers. These are uh, students that work with me on these projects. Amy Moore, she did the result, all the things I show you about bulk water and the freezing of ice. Jessica Johnson did uh, the um, results on the nanoparticles, CQAQ, the stacking faulted structures that are very large. Lille did the glass formation on nanosegregation, and Griffin Bullock, the crystallization of solutions. This was supported by the Beckman Foundation, NSF, and the Center of High Performance Computing, and thank you for your attention. nanoscale segregation of glass that occurs at low concentrations of ionic glass formers. Do you expect the same thing to occur with polar solute glass formers? And, and if so, would that also be concentration dependent and that that effect would disappear at higher concentrations? I, I expect a similar result, but I think that uh, hydroxylated compounds will be the most tricky. They are the most tricky because in this case, we can ensure that water is either with their forming the four coordinate domains or with the ions. So there is a big dichotomy there. In the case of the alcohols, for example, it's not so clear whether uh, water can be, the alcohols may be incorporated into the low density domains. There are some reports that suggest that, but I don't, I'm agnostic and I would say that I don't believe them completely. So I, in principle, I expect the same, but it's a much more nuanced case, the one of alcohols. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just kind of a dumb clinician, honestly, and uh, this is very, very important information. And your talks and Dr. Mazur's talk and Stan Lieba's discussion with me uh, has really enlightened me about the importance of rapid warming, which we have to use every day clinically. And I was just making the point to stay, I, I really didn't understand before, and now I do understand why it's so crucial. Uh, so I appreciate your talks. Very, very complicated for my level. Um, but you know, when I, uh, I have lots of fish frozen that I bring back from Alaska. They're immediately frozen vacuum packed. And uh, I know my wife used to figure we should thaw it carefully and then wash it and then, and then cook it. I don't like to do that because it's messy. I just uh, throw it directly on the grill and have a rapid thaw. I do the same. <laughs> and it because tastes much better. <laughs> and I wonder if that's related, because we just heard a talk earlier today about vitrification occurring naturally in nature all the time, and I'm wondering if that's the phenomenon that's going on. I don't know, but I do the same. It's good to have an explanation. <laughs> so I, I don't know, really, whether it's the same. Uh, I would ask. I don't know. I, I tend to frostbite. 
Fairbanks, the last board member by Harry Merriman, a man there that claims the world banks on an issue of frostbite. And apparently, the worst thing, the worst of what happened most of the cases of frostbite, Fairbanks was the winner of Memphis by minus 60. Yeah. And uh, the worst thing that happened, there were two classes of people, one in our mountaineers who get up and walk them down, the other drunks that pass out on a cold night and freeze. And the worst thing that happens is, you might say, mountaineers, we try to fall a limb slowly. Yeah. And that almost guarantees that we'll end up as gang. If it really freezes, we'll end up as gangrene. On the other hand, if you take the frozen limb or finger or hand or whatever, you can pull it rapidly. I don't think it's anything to do with these negative parts of the vascular effects I'm guessing. Well, there was a principle of orthopedic surgery for cold injury because I spent two years up in Alaska uh, 40 years ago. They, that was their principle, but they didn't understand it, and now I'm understanding it. I, I would like to just pursue a little bit of the question Brian has said to say, your aqueous solutions are lithium solutions. And ions have you know, major effects on water structure. And so are the principles of these plan of data where it applies, say, for more mold or blissful solutions, so whether it's light or not. The answer is that I cannot tell now. Wait one year and a half and I tell you. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's Janet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed your talk, and I think I understand it really well. Uh, and the question I have is whether the model of water that you chose without the hydrogen atoms, but with the hydrogen orientation, whether that particular model reproduces interfacial tensions appropriately. Yes. So the, the interfacial tension between uh, liquid and ice is, uh, is reproduced well and is uh, 32 in this model at, uh, at high temperature and then decreases on cooling. Then it's difficult to measure experimentally, so I cannot say whether the experiments follow the same, but at the temperature that is measured is exactly the same value. Now the surface vapor, the liquid vapor surface tension is also well reproduced by this model at room temperature, but it has the incorrect temperature dependence. Incorrect doesn't mean that goes in the other direction because Offset. the derivative of the surface tension with respect to temperature is the surface entropy, and the surface entropy of this model is smaller because when you go from the liquid to the gas phase or to the interface, you don't recover all the rotational entropy of water, but otherwise it's good. And actually it's better than the most popular atomistic models of water, the, the surface tension. is 66 um, for the liquid vapor and 32 for the liquid solid. Which is, which is very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I also thought it was a very excellent talk, uh, um, and uh, I just have a question about the, I, I might have missed it if you mentioned something about the time scales of these networks of uh, the four coordinated uh, water, how, you know, how, relaxation times, how, how long do they persist, how much time does it take for them to form? Yeah. So the, the reason why I didn't talk about the time scales is because the time scales in this model are unreliably fast because of the lack of a rotational motion. So it, it's like you don't have friction to move molecules around. But in terms of um, uh, the li these domains of four coordinated water in the, in the liquid, they survive for very short times. We still didn't compute the actual correlation times, so that the space, uh, spatial and time con uh, correlations, but uh, what we compute is that a molecule shifts between being blue and red, that means between four coordinated and high coordinated in the order of picoseconds. That's because you really, in the pure water, you really don't have to do much, only have to bring a neighbor close and far. Now in the case of the solutions it's quite different and the time scale for the fluctuations is dominated by the diffusivity of the ions and that means that in that case it's going to be associated to the particular um, mobility, effects of the mobility of ions on water and that's where I think that it comes an interesting point that I did mention that is that, if I go back, while the in term, let's say that I plot this in terms of water activity, instead of what I'm showing here. In that case, the universal lines would be, the melting line would be universal. The freezing line would be universal according to what is shown in experiments and here. But the glass transition line is not universal. The glass transition line, you can choose different solutes and this would change with the, with, with the solute. So that means that there is another degree of freedom here and this one will control the dynamics in the case of mixtures. What we saw is that in the case that we uh, slow down 
we really don't let the ions move, the crystallization is altered a lot because what you have is essentially domains that are distinguished, that are separated by threads of ions and if the domains are small, the crystallization will not happen at all if the domains are less than two nanometer size. Okay, thank you. Two questions. One, um, maybe I missed it, but your models um, predict the volumes that are produced as a result of these various Yes, so the, in terms of the densities, the density of liquid water is right. The density of ice is higher than the experimental one. And the reason is that when ice forms from liquid water, you have in liquid water a lot of bent hydrogen bonds, and they straighten. But there's nothing to straighten in this case because there are no hydrogen. So the difference between ice and liquid in experiments is 0 0.917 and 0 0.997. So it's uh, like significant. And here is 3%. So it's 7% against 3%. That's it. I lost which configurations? Well, it seems to me you have these micro Yes, all of these are... The no, the these are all fluctuations within the same uh, thermodynamic state. So let me... The density associated to this one are these. So we are going in the figure I showed you before, we are going from the temperature of maximum density to the uh, green point. So you see that the density is falling about... In this case, it's not falling much. In the experiments, will fall at about 0.93 or something like that. And the structure, the more blue you have, as blue is the four coordinated and it's lower density, the lower the density is going to be. And in that sense, yes, uh, there is a change in density that is significant. This is what explains the change in the, the decrease in the density of liquid water. And as the blue domains have also lower enthalpy and the more you produce cooperatively, the enthalpy goes down faster. That's why the heat capacity, that is the derivative of the enthalpy with temperature goes up. Yes. The second question has yeah. to do with, it is a, a beautiful study, and as you said in the beginning, you don't work on biological systems, so if you think of the, the state of water and the packed molecules within a cell is what we might learn. I'm, I'm here to learn from you, so I don't know much about the cell. Uh, to me, this is complicated. Uh, I, my next, uh, the next steps we're going to study, this is a very simple uh, model. and uh, we, we have studied our systems like fuel cell membranes with this, but it's, this is a very simple model. So the next stage for us is to study uh, glycols and alcohols in general. And with that, I will get to the alcohols, but then to put a protein is much more complicated and we, we are very far from that. Thank you for the questions.